Well, good morning, friends. Good to see you this morning as we are in week four of social distancing. Feels like month four to me. And we just continue to walk through the book of Romans together. And now we have turned a corner in the book of Romans, as Nathan so faithfully showed us last week. I'm really glad for the gifted teachers that God has given Southside. I was glad to be able to watch the sermon with my family last week because I will not watch myself preach. I would rather super glue my eyes shut than watch myself preach. But last week, Nathan showed us just how important that word therefore is in chapter 12, verse 1. Maybe the most important therefore in the whole Bible, as he mentioned. So I want us to point our attention there again as we begin our time together. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect." So that, therefore, is really important. We spent a whole year, whatever it is, in chapters 1 to 11, and it's been deep, and it's been rich, and we've seen a lot of theology of what God has done for us in Christ. And he hasn't told us to do a whole lot of things yet. And now when we're in chapter 12 and following to the rest of the chapter, he's largely going to be telling us to do things. So he's moved from exposition now to exhortation. And it's just so important to understand why he does that in the way he does, the order that he does. One way I like to explain it is in terms of uh, grammarian, grammatical language. It's been a while, so maybe you remember being taught the indicative mood versus the imperative mood. Well, the indicative mood is what has happened. It is the fact. The cat is on the mat. It's telling us something that, ha that is just a fact. Well, the imperative move, you hear it in that word, is it's an imperative. It's commanding us to do something. So put the cat on the mat. And so in many ways, Romans 1 to 11 is indicative. It's what God has done for us in Christ. It's gospel. Therefore, based upon all that indicative, now we have lots of imperatives, what we are to do. And you just got to get the logic of why he does that. It is so important that we move from what God has done to now what we are to do. So in many ways, we could summarize these chapters as work out what God has worked in. Or maybe become who you are. Or maybe become who you are becoming. It's just so important. It's really what sets Christianity apart from every other religion. At least gospel-centered, clear Christianity. Because every other religion, basically the message is be good people, be nice. God is our Father, love one another, and that's it. And obviously that's part of the message. But that part of the message that we're going to see comes after 11 chapters of what God has done for us. So the message of Christianity is not just be a good person. As we've seen in Romans, it's you're not a good person. None of us are. We are sinners. We, we need a right standing that we can't attain. And so the good news of the gospel is that God, through Jesus Christ, makes a way that we can have our sins forgiven and be declared in the right. Then, therefore, we begin to work on becoming good people, selfless people, people who love one another. So that's just really important to get. If you're a non-Christian here tuning in with us this morning, welcome, glad you're here. Uh, in a lot of ways, Romans 12 and following is not for you yet because it's for the church. Let me encourage you, if you haven't, go back and read from Romans 1 and following because the message for you is not, hey, be a good person, be a good Christian. The message is, hey, first trust Christ. You can never be good enough. Trust Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And then after that, we get on with the work of transformation what we call sanctification, being transformed. So because of what God has done for us in Christ, now we, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, lay our whole lives down for him in response to what he's done for us. I love the old hymn. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands, let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will, make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. 
So all that we've covered in Romans 1 to 11, it's the foundation. And then chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 really are the vision. And then the rest of Romans is going to unpack what it means to be transformed and what it means to have our minds renewed, how we are to be the church. And it's going to prove challenging in our current circumstances. Right now, we literally cannot apply some of the body life that we're going to be called to in Romans chapter 12. So let's look at Romans 12, 3 to 8, with three points this morning. Number one, be humble. Number two, be real. And number three, use your gifts. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Four, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to the faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So first we ought to be humble. It's there at the beginning of verse 3. It says, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And notice how it starts there. It starts with the word for. That word points to what came before, right? It's a connecting word. Whatever he's about to say is connected to what he just said. And we've already seen that, verses 1 and 2. The call to be transformed in light of all that God has done for us to, to renew our minds. So now chapter 12, 3 and following are specific examples of what it means to be transformed. It's really practical, really helpful on what it means to be transformed. And oftentimes we think of transformation, what again we call sanctification, just in individual terms. And obviously there's a lot of truth to that. We do need to be individually pursuing the Lord in prayer and the word and, and in other ways. But we're going to see here in Romans 12 that transformation is worked out in community. One of our core values as a church, we are in authentic community. Again, which is one of the reasons this quarantine business is so painful. Right now, it's hard to be who we were created and called to be. Body life is limited. Paul says, for by the grace given to me. And what he means is the grace given to me as an apostle. Back in Romans 1.5, Paul had said that he had received grace and apostleship for his mission. In Galatians 1 he says he was set apart before he was born. He was called by grace. And so Paul, as an apostle, by grace, tells us, the church, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. The New Living Translation says, don't think you're better than you really are. In other words, be humble, not proud. And pride for the Christian just doesn't make sense. It should be unheard of for a Christian to be proud. But... We've got to confess that all of us in some form or fashion are plagued by pride. C.S. Lewis says that pride is the essential vice. It is the utmost evil. He says it is the complete anti-God state of mind. So we don't want to be proud. And again, if we have the right mindset, how could we? I mean, just think about some of the silly things that we get proud about because we think we're smarter than others. Well, really, did, did we do that? Did we develop our mind? We think we're better than others because we have, you know, a better athletic ability. Well, really, did we choose our genes and our height? We think we're better because of our looks. And again, what did we have to do with looks? See, when we remember that we're creatures, we are created, and then that we're redeemed and we're redeemed solely by grace, how could we boast of anything? How could we be proud? Proud? How could we think of ourselves more highly than we ought? One of my favorite passages, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What do you have that you did not receive? Answer, not a thing. And so if then you received it, why do you boast? As if you did not receive it. We've got to remind ourselves and not think too highly. It just doesn't make any sense. 
When we think more highly of ourselves than we ought, we've lost our way, we've lost perspective. And so it's really important to have a realistic self-evaluation. And to do that, we need to know God. We really can't know ourselves rightly without knowing who God is. That's why in the very first sentence of John Calvin's theology book, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, he says this, nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. And again, we really can't know ourselves truly without knowing him. And when we do, we won't think too highly of ourselves. It says don't. Don't think too highly of yourself. And this word here, think, is really one of Paul's favorites. And it's used many times here. If we had a more rigid reading, we could say don't think more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober thinking. And remember, that's how he heads off this section in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, with the renewal of our mind, with the renewal of our thinking. And a renewed mind leads to right thinking about ourselves. And we just got to acknowledge just how different this is than where our culture is, right? Our culture is going to say the problem is, is the, or the real danger is too low of self-esteem. But really, the Bible would say our problem, the real danger is not too low of self-esteem, but too high a view of ourselves, self-centeredness. So we shouldn't think too highly of ourselves. It's really similar to what we saw just several weeks ago with Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. So the church should be characterized by those that are humbled by the gospel. Body life is most healthy when we have a right understanding. So how can we grow in this? How can we cultivate humility in our life? Well, lots of ways. Uh, there's one really good book by a guy named C.J. Mahaney called Humility. And he offers a list of suggestions in that book. He says some things we ought to do to cultivate humility. Always reflect on the wonder of the cross. If we just reflected more on the cross, so much would, would get in place. Thinking about why he had to be crucified, what led him there, our role in it, our sin. And so always thinking about the cross, 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, I resolve to know nothing among you except Christ crucified. Always do that. Then he says, as each day begins, here are some tips. Number one. Acknowledge your dependence on God. What if every morning you just wake up realizing, I will do nothing unless God helps me do it today? As each day begins, acknowledge your need for God, very similarly. As each day begins, express gratitude to God, thankful for all that he's given us. As each day begins, practice the spiritual disciplines. Be reading the word, jump in with F260 if you're not in with us. Be in prayer. If you're able to, if you're an essential worker and you have a commute, seize your commute with prayer and with scripture, memorizing scripture, meditating on scripture. Then he says, as each day ends, transfer the glory to God. And so every night, at least not pray together. By the way, if you're married husbands and you don't pray with your wife, tonight begin to pray with your wife. And one of the things we pray every night is, God, we just give you the glory for anything that happened today because again we acknowledge we had nothing to do with anything that happened that went well it's all him and so we transfer and honor him and thank him as each day ends also receive the gift of sleep and acknowledge his purpose for sleep one of which is just to remind us that we are not God he is the one who keeps Israel he is the one and the only one who never slumbers nor sleeps you and I can't go long at all every day it's actually really frustrating I just think about how productive I could be without sleep but every day we begin to tank and we have to go horizontal for six to eight hours <laughs> <laughs> what a reminder of our finitude. And so receive it. God, you are God. You don't need sleep. I do. Produces humility. And then for special focus, Mahaney says, do things like this. Study the attributes of God. Again, if we realize who he is, we'll realize who we are. Study his attributes, his holiness, his power, his omniscience, his sovereignty. Study the doctrines of grace and focus on the cross and our sin and seeing that, that it is all of grace. The only thing we contribute to our salvation is the need for salvation. He says, study the doctrine of sin. 
Most of us must by default have a faulty view of the doctrine of sin just because of the air we breathe. Well, if we start studying the Bible's teaching on sin, we realize that without Christ, we are way worse off than we really think we are. He says to play golf, (laughs) maybe something else challenging that you don't have a standard chance at. Then he says, laugh often and laugh at yourself. These are some helpful ways that we can cultivate humility. One of the ways we have healthy body life is that we are to be humble. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we ought to be real. It's there in verse 3. Let's read it again. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So be real. Think with sober judgment. Think sensibly. Sober just means accurate, right? It's the opposite of drunk. Maybe you have a a pagan background and you know what it is to be drunk. When you're drunk, you're not thinking straight. You're making foolish decisions. You can't even see straight, can't walk normally. You let your moral guard down. You get in your car and try to drive. You get tattoos. You say and do regrettable things. Or maybe you have a Christian upbringing and maybe your driver's ed teacher had you wear those drunk goggles. What's the opposite of that? Sobriety. Paul says, think realistically with sober judgment according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And this word for measure here is a standard. It's a standard by which to measure. So he's not talking about the amount of faith we have in here. He's talking about the standard of faith, which is the same for us all. So in that sense, we're all the same, but he goes on to say we're actually all different as well. So the third thing is then use your gifts. Use your gifts. Look at verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. So it begins with the fact that we're one body, we are the body of Christ, and therefore we are united. Ephesians 4 is one of the clearest places that teaches the unity of the church. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So we're one body, yet we have many members. It's really a really beautiful thing. There is a beautiful unity and diversity in the church. Probably the best parallel passage to our passage is in 1 Corinthians 12. Go ahead and turn over there if you've got a Bible, and I hope you do. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. Very similar teaching from Paul about the body and about the gifts. First Corinthians 12, 12. For just as the body is one, it has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews are Greek, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So we're one body with many members and all are needed. A disconnected body part is gross. (laughs) It's unnatural and will soon shrivel up. Each body part is essential. Those of you who have back problems, you know this, right? It may be one little section of your back, but your whole body is affected. Maybe your big toe, right? You took that toe for granted until you stumped it or broke it. 
then you know just how vital each part is. All of us have a gift. None of us have them all. Therefore, all of us are needed. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, God has specially gifted you with some gift that he wants you to use to help other believers. So because the body has many members, the church has many gifts. And Paul lists several here, but this is not an exhaustive list by any means. It's a summary for the types of gifts. We've seen some in 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4 mentions others. And every believer has one. And the church needs you to be using it. Look at Romans 12, verse 6. Romans 12, 6. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to the faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. We all have been gifted, and here again, Paul tells us it's by grace. Paul's an apostle by grace, verse 6, and we have been gifted by grace. Verse 6, Paul's an apostle, verse 3, we're gifted with gifts, verse 6. The Christian life from first to last and everything in between is all of grace. And here Paul just lists a few. He lists three speaking gifts and he lists four service gifts. And he begins with prophecy. Now, this word is used in a few different ways in Scripture. Sometimes, and especially in the Old Testament, it's used to predict the future. So it's foretelling in that sense. Sometimes it just means preaching. Most often in the New Testament, it refers to speaking under divine inspiration. So it is not so much a foretelling as a forthtelling. It's speaking forth the authoritative word of God. That was the function of a New Testament prophet, which, by the way, is the very same function of an Old Testament prophet. They spoke the infallible and errant word of God. So New Testament prophecy is speaking the infallible word of God. Listen to the way Peter describes it. 2 Peter 1, he says, knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So in the early church, they didn't have the New Testament yet. And so they needed the gift of prophecy and not just the gift of prophecy. They needed apostles to guide them in the truth. So God gave his church, God cares for his church, and he gives the church apostles and prophets as the foundation for his church. Listen to the way Ephesians 2, 19 to 21 puts it. So it's talking about the church. You're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, church, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, that most important stone in whom the whole structure is being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In the next chapter of Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 5, he speaks of the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And so a prophet and an apostle would have revelation from God that they would speak to the church. And so to build the church and get her going, before we had a New Testament, God gave apostles. Apostles would speak universally, and then he would give prophets who would speak to local situations as the foundation. And in my view, once the canon of Scripture was complete, we no longer needed apostles or prophets. They were foundational, and now we, we're still founded on their authority. But for us, the, the authority, the teaching of the apostles and prophets is right here in our New Testament. Now, having said that, Practically, I actually don't think there's a lot of difference between what I've just said and some of our charismatic friends that would define prophecy differently. Oftentimes, they'll define prophecy as being the Lord bringing something to mind, a spontaneous revelation, but not necessarily an authoritative revelation. And in terms of the, the practical output of that, you know, if the Lord puts someone or some word on our minds, I think we ought to obey absolutely. And he does that regularly. And I hope he does that regularly in your life. We ought to be open to the Spirit's prompting and leading and guiding. Absolutely. I just don't think that's what Paul means by the word prophecy. We'd call that an impression or being led or guided or a prompting. 
So practically, I think there's a lot of similarity. It's just what does the word mean here? And it seems to be a foundational gift for his church. And he says, with those who have this gift of prophecy, they need to do so according to the proportion of faith. And in the original, there's a definite article, the faith. So it's in proportion in accordance with the faith, meaning the Christian faith, the Christian message, the faith once for all delivered, as Jude 3 tells us. In other words, it can't contradict now what we have as the Bible. The other gift is in service. Service. This is where we get our word deacon, diakonia, and it means practical service. Some of you are gifted. You just love to help, help folk out. Even when it costs you, you gladly give of self to help others. And this gift can be used in a whole host of ways. What a vital gift for the church. And all Christians are called to serve, no doubt, but some of you excel at it. You love it. You love to meet needs, and God has wired you in that way. And the message is keep on. Use it for his glory. Use it to build up the church. And right now it's hard. But let me just encourage us all. How can we use the gift of service to help others, to serve others? I think there's a lot of ways. Checking in on one another, running errands for one another, especially those that are at risk, picking up groceries, helping out with kiddos, dropping off a meal, service. Next gift he mentions is teaching. Others of you are gifted to teach. You have the ability to make truth clear and understandable. And teaching is always been maybe especially now a much needed gift in today's church since there's so much biblical illiteracy more and more solid gifted teachers needed use it then he mentions exhortation and this word can be translated as encourage you're able to exhort to encourage to urge others to live out the truth of the gospel and this word has a bit of a pushing element to it So you can graciously nudge others in the right direction. I mean, some of y'all can slap a person in the face in such a way that they say, thank you, may I have another? And they feel loved. So what can you do? What can you do today? Well, you can make calls. You can write notes. You can do FaceTime, WhatsApp, Zoom, Google Hangouts. And you can encourage, hey, be faithful. Don't despair. Don't be fearful. We need more of this in the church. People willing to urge and encourage and exhort and say hard things when we know it's right and best. It's really a form of love. Then he mentions giving. Let's read it again. Look at verse 8, chapter 12, verse 8. The one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes, gives in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So giving, some of you are gifted with generous contribution. You find joy in sacrificially giving to the Lord and his work. And man, obviously this gift is vital for the flourishing of the local church. And this gift is fairly unique in that those with this gift aren't often encouraged because most people don't see what you give, right? I don't know what what people give, and so I'm not able to say thank you. If I see people serving in the nursery or bringing meals or whatever, I'm able to encourage. Others are able to see it and encourage, but this gift is kind of a hidden gift, and so you just have to be encouraged by the Lord and know the Lord sees it. So if that's you, thank you. Thank you for using your gift for the glory of God. And some of you are gifted with the ability to make lots of money, and that's a fantastic thing. The church needs more and more people that are entrepreneurial, sharp, who can make lots of money and then fund ministry and mission. And part of this gift, I don't think, is just just giving generously, but giving wisely, using God's money well, being a good steward. Then he mentions leadership, the ability to see the future and then take people there, to clearly cast a vision and know the best next step of getting there, having a preferred future. Two really common definitions of leadership one is that leadership is influence it's influencing people taking them from here to there and for Christians the there is where God wants them taking people from where they are to where God wants them another author similarly defined a leader as a servant who uses their credibility and capability to influence people in a particular context to pursue their God-given direction My favorite definition is leadership is taking initiative for the good of others and the glory of God. The influence definition is good. There's truth to that, but it puts the emphasis on the people where this definition puts the influence on you, the leader, you taking initiative to help others and to bring God glory, to make others successful, to help others. 
And again, in that sense, there's not that much difference between service and leadership. So Paul says, if you lead, lead with diligence, with zeal, with passion. Get after it. Get it done. And then he mentions mercy. And those with this gift have just a special care and burden for those in need, for the marginalized. You have a special place in your heart and you act on it. And I think the economic fallout of all this is really just beginning. And I think you're going to have ample opportunities to use this gift. And the Spirit says, keep it up. Keep doing so. And he says, do it with cheerfulness. Do it with joy. Let's zoom out then. What are the purpose of these gifts? Well, he actually doesn't mention it in Romans 12, but in other places like 1 Corinthians 12, he says it is for the common good, the good of the local church. 1 Corinthians 14 says, strive to excel in building up the church. So the local church needs your gifts. Ephesians 4 says that the victorious Christ gave these gifts to the church to build up the body of Christ. The church is matured. The church is built up in love as each member plays their part. Maybe you're like, I have no clue what my gift is. How do you discover your gift? Well, I'm getting an impression from the Spirit right now that when we all get back together, I can even smell it. It smells like dirty diapers. I'm getting the impression that when we all return, you will all be called to the gift of nursery. (laughs) No, but how do you discern your gifting? Well, try something. Isn't that what he says in verse 6? Let us use them. And so you learn as you go. God steers a moving ship. You ever tried to move a boat when it's not moving at all versus when it's moving? So what do you enjoy? What do you find satisfying? What's attractive to you? Where do you make a difference? Where do you notice areas of need, areas in need of improvement? Well, don't send an email. Jump in. Make it better. Find your gift. And don't try to do it all. You've got a gift. You don't have all the gifts. And so don't be burdened by trying to do everything. Find your place and contribute to body life. And as you do so, God will refine your gifts and make them clear. Some use this Venn diagram I think it's really helpful in discovering our gifts. You have ability, affinity, and affirmation. So you have ability. Again, what are you good at? Where do you have skills? And then that goes along with, needs to go along with affinity. What are you passionate about? What do you enjoy doing? What do you find yourself consistently praying about? And then to add to ability and affinity is affirmation. Where have others said, hey, you know what? You're good at this. You make a difference here. You've helped me by doing this. The church can help you see things you can't see. Now, these are special gifts, but all of us are called to all of these areas in certain respects. So just because you may not have a gift, you may not gift in a certain area, doesn't mean you ought not to work on all of these areas. Work on cultivating them. For some of you, though, it's just your gift. It's just going to come naturally. For others of us, we may have to work harder at it. But we should all work to grow in these areas. We're all called to serve and ought to grow in cultivating a servant mindset. We should all be growing in our ability to understand and handle the scriptures. We should all be exhorting when the opportunity arises. Exhort one another, Hebrews 3 says. Every day, as long as it is called today, that we might not fall away. We all need this urging and exhortation. Romans 15 Verse 14 says, to the whole church, I myself am satisfied about you, brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. And so constantly speaking the word to one another. We all ought to be growing in that. We're all called to worship God through giving. And we ought to be growing in that and seeking to increase our giving each year. Seeking to grow in leadership. Again, if leadership is just taking initiative to help people go from where they are to where God wants them, then again, all believers are called to it. It's not that different from discipleship. So whether it's in the church, the marketplace, the PTA, HOA, work at leading, work at creating an environment where people feel protected, where people are provided for, where people feel significance. Help others flourish according to the design of God. So we're called to cheerfully show mercy, all of us. Why? Because God has showed mercy to all of us. Friends, we're currently in a challenging time to do body life, but let's be creative. And when we get back, let's get after it. 
knowing in light of God's mercy, in light of all that he's done for us, all the grace we've seen in Romans 1 to 11, because of what he's done, let's lay down our lives for the Lord. And part of what that means is being humble, being real, using our gifts to build up the church. Let's pray together. Father, would you show us ways to be the body in a season where we can't gather corporately and can't, largely can't be face-to-face, would you show us, give us insight on how best? Would your spirit be at work giving us impressions and prompting us and leading us, put people on our minds and hearts that we might encourage and provide and, and speak a word of encouragement? And Lord, would you help us to think rightly? Lord, would we think rightly about you? And would that lead us to think rightly about ourselves? And if we do that, it won't be too highly, Lord. Would you produce a, a culture of gospel humility in Southside Baptist that we would think with sober judgment about ourselves? And Lord, we continue to ask you to stop the spread of this virus. We ask you to stop the spread of an abilene, that it would continue to be very slow with no outbreaks. We ask you to be kind in that way. We continue to pray also for the nation and for the world that you would stop this spread, that we would get out of this. We continue to pray for medical professionals, especially those that are yours, Lord, that you would use them in a a mighty way. We pray for the many families that are losing loved ones that aren't able to say goodbye, Lord, that you would give special grace in those moments. Thank you that we have nothing to fear. Even death itself is the last enemy, but it's already defeated. Thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray for those that are sick that you would bring healing. Pray for our homes. Lord, I pray that as there's more time together, that we would would buck the trend as we're hearing about more cases of abuse and marriages struggling with the church be a shining example of when we have more time together, it actually goes better. We flourish because of the gospel, because of your love for us, which then is reflected in our love for one another. Pray for the parents in this church that are a new season, and I pray that you would give them special grace, and Lord, that they would redeem the time and that they would disciple their children, be talking of you when they rise and when they walk and when they lay down. Lord, would you use this time? May we be grateful for the opportunities it brings, and we're excited to see how you use it for our good and your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.